Center County, eight food pantries administered by Central Pennsylvania Community Action are available to assist low-income residents. Many of these food pantries will find it difficult to serve those seeking assistance this year due to funding cuts. We are asking for your assistance. Both non-perishable foods and monetary donations are being accepted. For more information on how you can help or to make a donation, please contact us at 800-822-2610. Clearwater Conservancy has been conserving land and water resources in central Pennsylvania for more than three decades. If you've taken a stroll through Thompson Woods and State College, cast a line in Spring Creek and Belfont, or enjoyed the view of Musser Gap on Tussie Ridge, you've benefited from the efforts of the staff, volunteers, financial supporters, and partners of Clearwater Conservancy. We invite you to be part of the effort to conserve natural places in central Pennsylvania and educate the public about the need to do so. Learn more, get involved, and pitch in at clearwaterconservancy.org. You're watching CNET, Center County's Government and Educational Access Network. On September 8, 2012, the State College Borough hosted the Light Step Right Step Festival and Energy Expo. Various vendors and speakers came to share their knowledge of recent trends and new developments in energy conservation. Many had tips on how to live greener lives. People of all ages came to learn what they could do to leave a smaller footprint on our environment. This is the first year for the Light Step Right Step Festival and the Energy Expo. Um, it came out of the brainchild of a local group called Transition Town State College that looks at energy related issues and the borough who has a sustainability committee looking at similar sort of things and we were both going to put together an event like this found out we were both doing the same idea combined forces and came up with the festival um, we did receive some grant money from the West Penn Power Sustainable Energy Fund and our goal is to make this an annual event but this is the first time that we've had it there are 30 different vendors. We have contractors over here that specialize in green homes. We have Greenmore Gardens, which is a community-supported agriculture. Um, the whole purpose of the festival was to help people explain or understand the diversity of ways that we can live a lifestyle that's a little more sustainable. And this touches on a lot of the different areas, transportation, food, energy, education. So yeah, there's a wide diversity of groups. Here. The keynote speaker was Dr. Richard Alley, a well-respected Penn State professor in his field of energy sustainability. This is his speech entitled, Learning While Burning, Options for Our Energy Future. Thank you, Scott. That was great. So, thank you all for coming out. Thanks to the organizers, this is truly a great thing. This is something that it, it should run on for years and years and years, and this is a seed that's going to grow. So, so stay with that because this will be coming. So, so, and thank you for coming out on a somewhat interesting weather morning. So I'm going to take you through a story of energy. I'm going to take you through an optimistic view of something that can be scary if we don't do it right and, and see what we end up with. Um, and then thanks to the good folks at CNET as well. So, so just a couple of graphs to get us started. Uh, we're going to come into energy. Um, this is how much we spend on energy in the U.S. in trillions of dollars. That, that would be 1.5 trillion. We spend over a trillion dollars a year on energy in the U.S. And what that means is that your share is about four grand a year. So you're spending 4,000 bucks a year on energy. And about a thousand of that goes overseas and the other three thousand is spent locally. So, so you know, is, is it everything? Penn State costs more than that, but, but you know, nonetheless, four thousand bucks per person per year for energy in the U.S. is a reasonably large number. And it is about a tenth of the economy in very round numbers. So you pay for people to do things for you, you pay for some place to live, you pay for what have you, something to eat, but you know about 10 percent of the economy is energy. So it's big enough that this is something that matters, okay? I'm not sure what they're serving outside. I haven't gone out to look yet. But um, depending on what they're serving, you may be a shade over your 2,000 calories for today, but um, <laughs> if they're
they're frying it, uh, be this as it may, um, in round numbers, they say, okay, sort of a like diet is 2,000 calories. If you take the energy use in the United States and divide it by the number of people, and the trucking and the plowing and the cooking and all of this sort of stuff, and you put it in these archaic units, your share individually of the energy use in the United States is 240,000 calories, a little above that. Okay? So what you burn inside of you is 2,000. What you burn outside of you is 240,000. It is like you have more than 100 serfs doing your bidding. Serfs cook for me. Serfs plow for me. Serfs truck for me. Serfs pick up my car and run down. Interstate 80 at 70 miles an hour, okay? So, um, and we love this, okay? Be very, very clear. If you're a human, a lot of your job is to get somebody else to do your job for you. And this is, right, okay, this is how it works. Now, notice we probably spend more on food than we do on energy, but we get 100 times more energy than we do food. And so just how good the energy companies are at getting us stuff is really pretty amazing. And as we're going to see, it's almost all fossil fuel. Okay? Now, we have tried other ways to do it. You are in Penn's Woods, Pennsylvania. When the European settlers arrived on our shores, the story was that a squirrel could start at the Atlantic and go to the Mississippi without coming down out of the tree. There were trees everywhere. And we promptly set about cutting them all. And so this was Penn's Woods, but it, we, the first forester of Pennsylvania was a professor from Penn State, and he was referring to the great Pennsylvania desert because the trees were gone. Uh, were the Nittany Lions, there are no Nittany Lions, there wasn't a tree to do it behind. We basically, there's a million deer in Pennsylvania. There are basically were no deer. There were no turkeys. We wiped out the, the elk. We wiped, you know, we imported elk from the Rocky Mountains later. But basically, we just cleaned out the state. And the whole east, you, you hear the stories about our, our rugged ancestors doing their own thing and not being beaten up by government regulation. In the 1600s, Towns were outlawing cutting of trees because the trees were essentially gone, still in the 1600s, okay? So we basically took every tree we could get our hands on and we burned them, all right? Now, you were here in large part because of the iron makers. State College, in some very real sense, is a suburb of Penn State because when Penn State was established, State College did not exist. Penn State is built up the hill from the iron furnace down there at the bottom of the hill. And the iron furnace was run on charcoal. And the charcoal came from trees. And to run the furnace and to build a house and to keep the house warm in the winter for the people that ran the furnace, a furnace took almost a square mile of trees a year, one furnace. And these are names in Pennsylvania that have furnace. Pennsylvania furnace and Lucy furnace and center furnace and this and that and the other thing, okay? These, and these are forges, and the forges took that much more wood, Valley Forge and a whole bunch of others. What we did, we came in there, we cleaned it out. We cut the trees way the heck faster than nature ever grew them back. Now, if you have ever tried to read by firelight, flickering firelight, in a dark Pennsylvania winter, it doesn't work very well, okay? So what do you do if you want to read at night in the winter in Pennsylvania before electric lights, okay? Now, people use firelight, they use candles. They used to use something called camphene, which was a mixture of alcohol and turpentine, and it worked. But there's these hideous stories, if you got poor people use this, and these hideous stories of it blowing up. And, you know, the Methodist minister and his wife go out to visit the parishioners, and the daughters try to refill the lamp. And the three daughters burn themselves to death. And, you know, just, just terrible stuff. Rich people, what did they do? They burned whales, or whale oil. It didn't blow up. It didn't stink the way tallow candles do. It burned very, very cleanly. And so what happens? Shown over here, 1800. 1880, this is the history of whale oil production from the Yankee fleet, okay? And 
what, there's peak whale oil right there, okay? And there's a lot of reasons. There's a civil war hiding in here, and somewhere in here the, the fleet gets trapped off Alaska in the sea ice, and they get crushed, and the ships go down, and the insurers say, screw this, we're not going to insure your ships anymore. So there's all sorts of things hiding in here. But what were they doing off of Alaska in the sea ice looking for whales? The easy ones in the Atlantic were gone. And this is the cost. And in modern dollars per gallon, so you can run your lamp and see in the evening, this is about $7 a gallon. Here's peak whale oil. Look at this. That's up above $20 a gallon. And this is the first modern oil well, right up the road here in Pennsylvania, where there was an oil seep. It was coming out of the ground. And they said, oh, hey, we can, we can go drill for this. And so you can see what happened. We got on a topic, trees, and we burned them way faster than nature made them. And then we try something else, whales, and we burn it way faster than nature made them. And then we say, well, let's do something else. And, and what are we doing? Same thing. Okay. Now, they knew this. This is actually 1861, Vanity Fair. This is a, a editorial cartoon, and it is in honor of the oil wells of our native land. May they never secede. Oil's well that ends well. Okay? They, they knew this. We have whales and trees because we burn fossil fuels. And it really is just about that simple. We have whales and trees because we burn fossil fuels. And they knew it in the 1800s. This is a cover of a piece of sheet music from 1864. This is the American Petroleum Polka. Okay? This oil well threw pure oil 100 feet high. Okay, now, the young lady in her, her pink dress, okay, they didn't want black oil to stain her pink dress, so they made it white, but it was black back then, don't kid anybody, all right? But they're doing, you know, it's a polka to the glory of oil. The, the value of this stuff to us is really pretty amazing, and we need to start there, that it really is, okay? So our history is we burn through whatever source we can find, we live with whatever it does to it, and then we go looking for a new one, and we keep filling in with renewables when we need them. So the early settlers on Cape Cod, they're catching cod. And they want to pack it in salt and ship it to England for trade. And where do you get salt on Cape Cod? Well, they started boiling the seawater. Well, how do you boil the seawater? You use trees. Bang. Still in the 1600s, they outlaw cutting trees because the trees are about done. The trees were gone from the late 1600s until the early 1900s. There's basically no trees on Cape Cod. Thoreau is walking Cape Cod, and he says what they call woods are waist high. He went to one town, and he said the only trees in the whole town are a row of Lombardy poplars around the town square, and they're all dead. Okay, um, so, so what did they do then? They went to a wind and sun system. They started using windmills to pump the, the seawater. They started using sun to dry it, and they turned into a net exporter of salt because they could do it with renewables. So what do we do? We burn everything we can get our hands on, and then we use renewables, okay? This is what we're doing now. A little over a third petroleum, natural gas sort of a quarter and rising, uh, coal almost a quarter, a little nuclear, a little renewables. Add up all the fossil fuels, it's most of it, okay? Most of that energy that we get all this good from is fossil fuels, okay? It is, the scale is amazing. If you fill up your car, it's sort of 100 pounds of gasoline, right? If you had to bring home all those gallon jugs of gasoline, the way you bring home milk, it would be a different world, but you put it in the car and you drive away. When you burn it, you're taking oxygen out of the air, you're adding oxygen, and you're making CO2. And a tank full of gas makes something like 300 pounds of CO2. And every week, you fill up the car if you're a commuter. These poor schmoes from down at Philadelphia or D.C. that have to commute. You fill up the car with 100 pounds of gas, you make 300 pounds of CO2, and then you do it over again. So I want you to do the scaling for me. Suppose that that CO2 came out in a way you could see it, okay, as horse ploppies. <laughs> we would not be having this discussion, 
Okay? <laughs> be very clear. We would not be having this discussion if the CO2 came out as horse poppies. Because that may, it's a pound a mile. Okay? Right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay? okay? If you spread it uniformly around the roads of America, the CO2 from our cars would make a layer an inch deep every year. That's out in Nevada, that's all the interstates, a layer an inch deep every year on the roads. In a decade, there are no joggers in America. We are all cross-country skiers, okay? <laughs> right? Okay. So, so the scale of this really is an amazing thing, okay? This is a history of CO2. Uh, this is from ice core bubbles, 1,000 years ago. This is ice core bubbles and instrumental measurements taken at various things. We have raised CO2. It's our CO2. I, I, the TV show shows some of the reasons we know how we know it's our CO2. It's our CO2. We have used easy oil. Okay, I'll say a minute about that in just a minute. But there's a lot of tar sand. There's a lot of coal if you take the tops off of a lot of mountains. These are various possible futures of what we might do to CO2. And if we really burn it all, we can change the atmosphere a lot more. Okay, so have we raised CO2? Yes. Is it our CO2? Yes. If you had me do the next talk, I'll do that. But uh, you can take my word for it now, and I can tell you how we know later if you ask. Um, have we finished? No. Okay. In round numbers, nature made the fossil fuels in a few hundred million years. We are burning the fossil fuels in a few hundred years. We are burning them about a million times faster than nature saved them. Does nature make more? Yes. Does make nature make more on a time scale that is even vaguely interesting to us? No. Is this something that we use and then it's gone? Yes. Is it something that we have to find a solution eventually? Yes. We keep working on harder and harder ones. So I, I get a kick out of this one, right? When I was young, you turn on the TV and there was a television show on there, and it was a story about a man named Jed. <laughs> uh, and he was a poor mountaineer and barely kept his family fed, and one day he was shooting at some food, and up through the ground come a bubbling crude. <laughs> and that was, they could do that with a sort of straight face. The first modern oil well was drilled at a place where oil was leaking out of the ground. And you say, how do we know to drill an oil well here? Well, it's leaking out of the ground. Maybe we'll go find some more. That stuff's good. They're out in the deep water of the Gulf, drilling in deep water and drilling miles down, not because they love throwing money away, but because the easy oil's gone. Okay. Now, we're finding new ways to get oil, and there's a lot more out there. But the easy stuff is gone. They're really, really to get to. We can take the tops off the mountains, we can frack everything, we can tar sand everything, we can oil shale everything, and then we can look for a solution. Or we can start looking for a solution now. But eventually we have to, because we're using it a million times faster than nature saved it. This doesn't go on forever. If we decide to burn before we learn, I'm going to give you the very brief sketch of a very long talk, which is if we decide to burn and then learn, we have made life harder for poor people in hot places today and for a whole bunch of people who haven't been born. If we learn while we burn, we can make people better off. Okay? So there's the story. Okay? So is fossil fuel burning raising CO2? Yes. Is that causing warming? It's physics. Okay? Let me, let me bop ahead here. Right after World War II, the Air Force says, we operate in the atmosphere. We need to understand it. They said, we want to do things like making heat-seeking missiles. And if we're going to make a heat-seeking missile, we're going to look at the heat from the enemy bomber. And we have to put a sensor on there to see the heat from the enemy bomber. And if we put the sensor in the wrong wavelength, I can't see anything because CO2 is in the way. And the atmosphere does not care whether you're studying it for warring or for warming. CO2 blocks that radiation. And if you put a satellite up today, you say, oh, look, this is the Earth. It gets energy from the sun. It sends heat back to space to stay in balance. But 
there's a divot in what it sends back to space, and that's because CO2 is blocking it, and it could block more. Does CO2 have a warming influence? Yes, it's physics. Is there any way to avoid that? No, we can't think of any possible way to avoid that. Is this a story? Is this made up? Get off of it. This is physics. They show you the water vapor loop on the evening weather forecast. They could show you the CO2 loop. It's observed every day. It's just plain physics, okay? Now, I'll show you a couple things on how we know that, that warming is occurring. I'm not going to walk through the details of the most of the rest of this. But you'll often hear people say, yeah, I know it's warming. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. But isn't that mostly natural? Well, everything we can measure on nature is that nature has done very little recently. And if anything, nature has tried to cool it off a little. We've had satellites watching the sun for 30 years. The sun's gotten just a little bit dimmer. We humans have put up a whole lot of particles that block the sun. We humans have cut darker forests and replaced them with lighter reflective grasslands. And so we're trying to cool it off, and nature's trying to cool it off, but it's getting warmer. How much of the warming so far has been caused by us? Our greenhouse gases have caused a little more than all of it because these other things are actually trying to cool it off. So you'll hear this story, oh, isn't it partially natural, partially human? Yes, a human, a nature may be pushing a little bit the other way, okay? So, and there's a whole bunch of pieces to this story. The fingerprint, the spatial changes are those you expect from what we're doing primarily. And so there's a whole bunch of pieces of this story. It is physics. How do we know it's getting warmer, okay? You take thermometers, and you show warming. If you threw away the thermometers in the cities and just looked at the ones out in the country, they show warmer. If you look at the thermometers as analyzed by National Oceanographic Atmospheric Administration, they show warming. NASA shows warming. Uh, Berkeley got some money from, partially from the government, partially from fossil fuel sources. They looked at the data, they said, oh look, it shows warming. People in other countries are looking at the same data. What do they see? They show warming. If you look at thermometers placed in boreholes in the ground, the ground is warming up. If you look at thermometers placed in the ocean, the ocean is warming up. If you look at thermometers taken aloft on balloons, they show warming. If you look at thermometers looking down from satellites, they show warming. If you go to the snow and ice and say, let's find the parts that are temperature sensitive, not Minus 50 in the middle of Antarctica, warming from minus 50 to minus 40 won't melt it up there. Go to the ones that are temperature sensitive. What do you see? Sea, lake ice, Arctic sea ice, frozen ground perennially, frozen ground seasonally, uh, seasonal snow cover, mountain glaciers. The great majority are shifting in the direction of warming. If you go ask, where do plants and animals live and when do they do things during the year, 90% of the significant changes are in the direction expected from warming. Put it together, thermometers analyzed by different groups in different countries in different ways placed in the ocean, in the ground, in the air, at the surface, looking down from satellite. Look at living things, look at ice and snow. They all tell the same story. Is there any way that one or two mistakes or anything else can change that story? No. It is an interwoven tapestry of evidence and if you cut a couple of threads, it's still there. The picture still works. The big results that are brought out of science and taken to the community are all like this. They're not hanging of a single thread. They're an interwoven rope of strong evidence. And the evidence that the warming is from us is similarly strong. Okay? Now, this is where it gets really important. This is a, the last 100 years of temperature. This is the warming we've caused. These are various possible futures. What you will notice is that the warming so far is large enough that we can document it scientifically, but it's pretty darn small compared to what can come if we keep burning. And we're on track towards sort of the upper ends of these right now. Okay? Now, if you go and ask, what does this mean? Ask people and say, okay, the climate changes, so what? If you live, like us, 
we have winter and maybe you know you don't like shoveling snow you have bulldozers so if the ocean rises a little bit you'll build a wall or you'll move things you have air conditioning so you could work in the summer a little bit of warming doesn't hurt you very much there's winners and losers as the warming gets big the people that look at this say it turns into more and more and more losers and fewer and fewer winners and so that's what this one is trying to show over here as the warming gets big red means bad in most ways for most people white and yellow means some winners some losers what we've done so far is still in the, yeah, some people are unhappy, but some people aren't hurting too bad. But notice what happens to all these different things you might worry about, like um, unique and threatened ecosystems and extreme climate events and the, the aggregate effect on the whole economy. As the warming gets big, the losers grow and spread. So, so far, what we've seen is enough to scientifically validate what we know. It shows that our understanding is good, and that understanding says, as the change gets big, the losers grow and spread. Okay. How does it happen? Maybe the biggest one would be up here. A lot of the things we grow today, if you give them enough water, you give them enough food, you give them enough light, you give them enough space, on the hottest day of the summer, they're not happy. And we face the possibility that the hottest summer we've ever seen will be below average in your lifetime. Okay. So, and I'll show you something on grain belt drying here in just a minute. Sea level rise is very hard to avoid. This doesn't mean you're going to get malaria, but it means one line of defense is going to go away, freezing the bugs. Um, we, the Nature Conservancy has done this amazingly wonderful work at trying to save unique and threatened places. But if you save a national park, or you save a nature conservancy reserve, or you save something else, and the climate changes, and those unique threatened species have to move a thousand miles, and there's a thousand miles of parking lots and cornfields in the way, how do they get there? And so there's, that one is, uh, we may even have fewer hurricanes, but there's more fuel. They can blow faster, they can do more if they've got more energy to go, so you, and most of the damage is by the strongest winds. Um, more variability in the water system, uh, so more flood and more drought seems likely to come. Uh, in the winter, all winter, the, my garden is damp. And in the summer, you know, it, you have a downpour and two weeks later you've got to water the tomatoes. More variability as it's more summer-like. Okay. This is a plot. Up here is drought in the last decade. Um, drought is relative to what you expect, right? So the Sahara, they expect it to be dry. It's dry, but anything red there sort of had drier than they were expecting. This is a projection of late in the lives of a lot of you who are students here now of drought when you're old. And if this is redder, this is a bad thing. And I think you'll see that, yeah, it's, they expect it to rain up there, but where most of us live, they expect more drought. Okay. People who, they, Rear Admiral David Dentley was, is a Penn State grad, okay? He, he has looked at this, he speaks in our, our TV show, and he says, you know, this is not the biggest thing for national security. Bad guys with bombs is probably the biggest thing for national security. But, you know, climate change, energy security, and economic stability are inextricably linked. Climate change contribute to food and water scarcity, increased spread of disease, may spur, exacerbate mass migration. This is the Pentagon. Okay, this is not... Pick your favorite bleeding heart liberal cause. This is the Pentagon, okay? And he says, look, we got a whole bunch of things to do. You're going to ask us to handle the Arctic because we're going to have another coast up there that's open, and we're going to have a theater of operations, and the Navy's going to be asked to deal with this. Okay. This one is sort of, and, and this leads somewhere, okay? I am not making a prediction. This is a paper. People are looking into this some more. But you know if you get locked in a sauna that you, it can kill you eventually. If it's too hot that you can't evaporate sweat, you overheat eventually. There's nowhere on the world today that is so hot that you have to die of heat stress. In one set of modeled runs, 
if we burn all the fossil fuels we can get our hands on, a lot of places in the world get to that temperature. Which, uh, and so like I say, this is not a prediction, but this is a possibility that um, the habit, calling the habitability of some regions in the question for unprotected humans. Okay? And so this is really, and, and this is important. I want to get walked through first. Most of you don't have to be commuters, but I want you to imagine being a commuter for a moment. Okay? So if you're a commuter, you're going to drive your car somewhere. You're going to DC or what have you. And what do you expect? You expect some problems, right? You get in the car and, and you get stuck in traffic and then you know you turn on the radio and it's not something you want to listen to. Okay? What's the best thing you can hope for as a commuter? You know, not much problem, right? There's no traffic and this is the Beach Boys Festival. Okay? But that isn't really that likely, to be perfectly honest. So it's more likely that you'll have some problems. But you know, you could get in the car and you get really stuck in traffic. There's been an accident in front of you and you turn on the radio and they're doing the, the emergency broadcast test, right? And so that's possible too. But you're sitting there and a semi runs over you. You know, you get hit by a drunk driver. And it's not very likely that you get hit by a drunk driver. But it is possible that you have really huge problems. And there's a lot of things in the world are like this. You expect some problems. You hope that you won't have any, but that's not very likely. And you really hope you don't have something disastrous. Now, what do you do about this? Your car has airbags, your car has crumple zones, your car has this cage in it to try to protect you. It has anti-lock brakes. If you get a kid, you have kid seats. You may support mothers against drunk driving. You, you've got catastrophic insurance. A reasonably large fraction of your transportation budget goes into things that you don't expect to happen, but they're bad things. Now, when we think about climate change, you're thinking about, wow, it was hot this summer, and then maybe it was dry, and maybe, maybe the climate change contributed a little bit to that drought. But are you thinking about some huge jump in the climate? Are you thinking about an ice sheet collapsing and flooding the coasts in a hurry? Are you thinking about making some places so hot that we can't live there without protection? And there's at least a slight chance that nature has these drunk drivers out there. And I'll tell you the truth, I have participated in some, some testimonies down in, down in Washington, the Senate and House and committees and what have you. My impression is that most of the public discussion I've been caught up in has been down here. Me saying, here's our best scientific estimate, and it could be better and it could be worse, and somebody else saying, oh, don't worry, it'll be fine. It might be. We really might have no traffic in the Beach Boys Festival. We really might. It's possible. But that's out there. Okay. Now, do the economics. Okay, what do we know? We expect here that over a few decades, the damages go to a few percent of the world economy per year, so a few trillion dollars. Um, and and the, the economists say, look, if you want to fix this, you know, sort of 1% of the world economy. And few is bigger than one, so if you want to be economically smart, you start now to head off climate change. Well, you start 30 years ago, but nonetheless, you don't panic, you don't do anything in a big hurry, but you get started on it if you just want to make money. If you include the uncertainties, if you say, well, wait a minute, what about this? You do more now. Okay? The truth is, you'll not hear this one very often, but the truth is, the less you trust me, the more you should be worried. <laughs> because the drunk drivers really are out there, and just cranking things real hard is an issue. Okay? This is another issue. On top, red means a person is contributing a good bit to climate change, and blue means that they're not. On the bottom, red means a person is vulnerable to climate change, and blue means that they're not. 
And what you'll notice is the people contributing are not very vulnerable, and the people not contributing are pretty vulnerable. And there's a lot of people in the world, including me, belong to religious or other organizations that are troubled by that. It is absolutely illegal for me to take a dump in your front yard. <laughs> but I can use my horse ploppies to change your climate. Okay. All right. Now, I'm going to talk about alternatives, what you can do about it. Be very clear. 10% of the economy is a lot of money. It's a lot of jobs. It's a lot of things. Getting that much energy, anything we do has impacts. If we do windmills, we're going to kill birds. If we do solar cells, we're going to shade out cacti and desert tortoises. If we do dams, we're going to change rivers. If we do fracking, we might do water and we're earthquakes. If we do anything we do has impacts. Okay? We've got to weigh them. We've got to be 